Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second round of Norway Chess. Friendly reminder of how this tournament works. There are 10 players and they begin every round playing a classical chess game with two hours and only bonus time beginning on the 40th move. So the time just starts ticking the second that your clock is pressed. Uh, if the classical game is drawn, they play an Armageddon. So white gets 10 minutes, black gets seven minutes. Uh, and uh, on the 40th move of that game, you get one second bonus. If you win in Classical, you get three points. You win in Armageddon, you get one and a half. Black obviously gets less time in the Armageddon because a draw means that you win. Cool? Wonderful. Earlier today, there was an article posted by the Financial Times um, called Chess. Carlson set for Stavanger this week. Actually, it might have not been posted today, maybe two days ago. But has the world champion peaked? And it was a very dramatic title about explaining why they think Magnus has peaked. He used to be 2889. You know, now he's not that rating. Um, and he's also shown no interest in defending his title again and, and all this, you know, all, all this stuff. So, um, very dramatic. So let's see how Magnus responds to these allegations. Now, the, the, or the earlier game uh, between uh, Wesley and Magnus was just a draw. The classical game... Uh, nothing to look at. They traded literally every piece except bishops and a couple of pawns. So we go to the Armageddon. Wesley begins with e4, e5. Remember, Wesley just won the Blitz and he won yesterday in Classical. Uh, so he's in good shape. Uh, we have an Italian, knight f6, d3. Uh, and Wesley plays this very provocative approach, bishop g5, trying to get Magnus to uh, play d6 and then play g5. And, and, and Magnus for, plays d6, but then he waits a little bit. He makes a couple of uh, a couple of waiting moves with a6, bishop a7, knight bd2, queen e7. Like he's still, he's still, what is Wesley doing is really the question that he's trying to ask. What, what, what does Wesley want in the position? And remember that Magnus only has seven minutes. He has seven minutes to make it to move 40 or seven minutes not to lose, right? So now he plays g5 uh, and the knight goes back to h7. Knight going back to h7 has a couple of ideas. First of all, you're defending this with this. So on your next move, for example, you can play h5, g4. That's one of the ideas. Uh, the second idea behind knight h7 is that you would like to move the f-pawn. Either now or castling, move the king to the corner, and then f5. And the third idea behind this move is that you'd like to rotate the knight itself around and maybe go to f4 and maybe fight for the center. Magnus implements that game plan and then, obviously, has to deal with a couple of Wesley's uh, aggressions over there, knight g6. Now, at some point, you can bet that Magnus will also play h5. So, like I just said, it's a very aggressive approach. He has multiple plans in the position. Wesley playing rook b1. This is really funny because Wesley just seems completely unbothered by what's going on over there. I, 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 I mean, this looks pretty scary, I have to tell you. I mean, h5, h4, I mean, Wesley just, I guess, is going to rely on b6. He's going to rely on shutting this bishop out of the game, this knight out of the game, and I don't know. Um, so, I mean, he, 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 he's got three extra minutes. It helps a lot when you are up nearly half of your opponent's starting time to start uh, the Armageddon, which they might have to change. They might have to make it 10-8. Um, but okay, six pawns per side, and now Wesley plays bishop d5. The best move here was knight c4 putting a little bit of pressure right here. But um, there are other ideas in mind. Uh, and and, and, and uh, the other idea in mind is the fact that after g4, you now suddenly have this amazing move, uh, which you didn't have earlier. Knight takes h4, bishop h4, and you take on d6. So that you, you, you break through. And then you get this as well. And apparently white is completely winning. Uh, maybe, actually, king, king d7, uh, no, king d7, king, okay, king d7, you actually take the bishop and then you take this, and then here, but if something like king f8, uh, knight takes f7 is good, knight c8 is also good. Um, so apparently white is just winning if you play knight c4, because then you have knight h4. Wesley plays the far more human approach, uh, and here comes Magnus, right? I mean, just galloping into the position. He's now played 20 of the necessary 40 moves to get the bonus time. Uh, seems like he's in good shape. Who's peaked? Definitely not the world champion. D4, complete battle here. I mean, it is an absolute war on the board. 24 moves down. Knight B3, Knight D8. Rook A5, Knight takes G3, and Queen G5. I mean, Magnus has an outstanding position. The position is in the balance. He has played 26 of the 40 moves. He's about to get that one second bonus. Um, I mean, his bishop on A7 is just super strong. The rook is wide open. But the position actually is equal, which is kind of insane. Uh, Knight C6. Wesley takes it and plays queen a1. Look at this completely unbelievable. Like, what is this is craziness. And it's good. Magnus moves out of the way, and as his bishop perishes, he grabs the knight. All right, we are now in the 30th move of the game. 
it's completely equal material. It's a totally balanced position. Magnus defending on the back rank. Three of his four pieces are on their starting squares, and he's not even worse. Queen c7, knight f1, takes, takes. I mean, normally by this point, Magnus's ability to resist frustrates people, and they do something ridiculous. But Wesley is not like that. Wesley is keeping his cool, and he has much more time. So finally, we make it. Both sides have made 40 moves. But Magnus has five seconds and Wesley has 40. So he has eight times the amount of clock time. All right, that is a lot of clock time. So what happens? We have queen d6. The position here is two versus three, but white can't really use two of these pawns. They're completely blockaded. But black has a slightly weaker king. Queen and knight are a lethal combination. And Magnus, in his three seconds on the clock, drives the queen to c5 to pin the knight. And all of a sudden, Wesley plays one move, e5. Why is it so good? It cuts the queen. And on the very next move, Wesley plays queen g5 check, justifying that e5 move, and now king h2. With two ideas in mind. The first of which is now he is able to move the knight. The second of which is he might be able to play rook h1 and king to g1. The threat is to play king g1 mate. King to g1 is a mate itself. So all of a sudden, because this king is stranded with no defense, Magnus has to scramble. But Wesley just brings in the knight, gets it back, gets the, the bishop back immediately. And the rook and queen are just going to beat up the king. And the game is over. It's forced mate. Queen f6. And Magnus resigns because if he goes here, it's mate. Uh, if he goes here, however... There is queen f7, and then there's going to be a check, and then there's going to be mate on d8 again. And Wesley So beats Magnus Carlsen. Woo! Wesley! Damn! Now, I'm not one of these sensationalist uh, you know, news headline uh, sports analysts, you know, that you see on TV, like a team loses, and all of a sudden they got to blow it up. They got to fire the coach. They got to fire the players. They got to fire the uh, arena workers. They got to fire the general manager. It's not like that. But it's funny. It's a little bit of kind of, kind of cruel that, you know, they start, they start bringing this. And it's true. A couple of years ago, when Magnus played a tournament, he was going to win it. Like, he was just, it didn't matter who he played. So now it's kind of crazy to see, like, a little bit of people catching up. You know, there's the young wave of players. Um, and, yeah, I mean, now Magnus is saying he's not going to defend the world championship. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Second game that I have for you was also, uh, actually, this uh, game of Classical was even more boring. Uh, these guys went to an Arm uh, Armageddon, uh, and uh, it was a very obscure sideline of the Petrov defense, uh, where early on there was a lot of tension between these queens, and neither one of them was moving. Neither guy wanted to trade queens, and MVL said, you know what, we're not going to trade queens, I'm going to castle long, you're going to castle short. Mamidyarov goes for this all-out approach because as we saw in the game with Magnus, you can last as long as you want. You can go 40 moves and, and survive, but at the end of the 40 moves, you're going to have five seconds, and uh, this format is not very friendly, right? So he decides, all right, let's scrap. Knight to e4, takes, takes, and I mean, MVL's got a very clear game plan here. His game plan is, I attack your king side, all right? And the center is locked. No one can do anything. Mamidyarov plays knight b6, and decides to grab a pawn for himself. So MVL has sacrificed the pawn. But he sacrificed the pawn to open the G file. But Mamidyarov has taken the pawn because he's like, I'm up a pawn. Either he mates me, I'm already a not a very big favorite in the Armageddon, or I, I win because I'm just up a pawn, right? So he plays queen b5 looking for a queen trade. MVL says, okay, sure. What? What? Well, here's the thing. I think MVL didn't want to be attacked himself. I think MVL just was like, I, you know what? He kind of makes a fair point. All right, I'm just going to take the queen and play bishop f1. And um, yeah, several moves later, we have the following position where MVL's knight has galloped to the edge of the board. All right, the rook is hanging. The pawn is hanging. So he's, he's going to win the pawn back. So now he's not down a pawn anymore. And somehow these pawns put up a lot of resistance against this bishop. This bishop is not involved in the game. And... White has a massive pawn majority, so he has a four on two. These pawns cancel out, it's a four on two. And this, you can say, is two on zero. 
Who's gonna push these pawns? You really gonna push these pawns and like lose everything? No! But these pawns, there's more of them and there's less danger the opposite way. So the game is probably gonna be decided with that massive pawn majority. Let's see MVL go to work. Removes the bishop. I like how his bishop on f1 served one purpose. It moved one time and it was traded. And now it's knight versus bishop and a huge queenside pawn majority and black has no moves. This is the worst nightmare situation for Mamid Yarov who now trades down into an endgame where he is down a pawn and MVL rides off with his pawns. C4, trades the rooks, B4, A4, B5. Couple moves later, C5, connect four by MVL. Now you notice, I mentioned a long time ago that these pawns could also get rolling, not when the rooks were on the board, but it's not enough. Four on one is not two on one, all right? This is a four on one avalanche. This is not the same thing, all right? So knight back to E2 blockades the pawns, and that's it. I mean, you, you just, you can't do anything here. And the truth is it doesn't even matter. Like you think, oh, well now my pawn is surviving. Nope, nope, because the second you push it, I'm gonna take it. The pawn has to stay here, and black runs out of moves. I mean, black just runs out of moves. Let's say, like, I mean, you, literally black just runs out of moves. If takes B7, black just doesn't have, he can go to the corner. I can play C6 anyway. You say, Levy, what's the big deal? Well, what happens here, folks, is uh, the white king will, 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 will walk up the board. So king d4, you still can't push because I'll go win the pawn. So you go here, king c5, and king c6, and now in brute fashion, you will get mated. So you, you just cannot, if the pawns are too far advanced and the king is too far, it's game over. And um, that's really what happens. I mean, MVL just blockades the pawns on g2. And Mami Jarov has to call it a day. He could have kept his pawns on the light squares and tried to defend with the bishop, but it, it, it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, it just wouldn't have mattered. So MVL wins a very exciting uh, Armageddon game uh, after not a very exciting classical game. Um, and a third game was decided in the Armageddon as well. Uh, this one was a G3 Nimso, so a very rare sideline. Uh, there's a lot of obscure theory here, like c5, knight f3, cd4, knight d4, knight e4, something like this, trying to go for this uh, this piece here. Um, I used to play g3 with white. I understood nothing about it. And there's this like kind of uh, better uh, Catalan for black style position because taking on c4 is very common in the Catalan, but it's not common for white to play knight c3. Uh, so castles, knight c6, and I think there's a line here, queen a4, uh, knight d5, and queen back to c2. I've played this myself a couple of times with white. The best move here for black is to go back to e7, and then white plays like rook d1, rook b1, e4. Dubov has played this a handful of times. Um, but in this game, we have rook e1, and black plays rook b8, and his idea is going to be to defend this pawn, right? So he defends the pawn like this, and, and, and black is uh, not better here, but he's most certainly not worse. I mean, he's a pawn up. Now we see b5, uh, h6, and the thing that I've never understood about this position is that black is okay. Like, Stockfish is like, yeah, black is fine, but it's so hard to make a move. Like, black is fine, but white has a beautiful position and now plays d5, and in this situation for an Armageddon format, this is a wonderful way to play with white because black is going to end up having to spend all their time defending the position, which is kind of what Tari is doing, and he's doing a great job. He's actually done a wonderful job here, but it doesn't matter because Rajabov has more time to kind of create more problems, right? So rook d7, g5, here comes Rajabov, just guns blazing, queen back, and uh, a trade, and hello, high g7 pawn. Now Tari here, if he has any more time to think, will go bishop takes h3. It's a winning move, apparently. Because takes, queen h3, bishop takes g7, and he just has rook d8, and apparently this is just winning. Bishop goes back to f8, or queen g3 check, aggressive move, because this is pinned. Um, right? But he goes here, and now after bishop h8 threatening a mate, he has to play f5, oh my goodness. Uh, this is the thing, right? You got low time, you gotta defend this very unpleasant position. Bishop f6, king h7, here comes knight h4, the queen is transferring over, oh my goodness. I mean, Rajabov is winning the pawns on the king side. Rook f7, e5, it's just that's it. I mean, the game is over. Knight takes g6 is coming, bulldozing the king over here. These Armageddon games are super exciting, but the quality is not as high 
as classical chess. It's also not as high as rapid chess. Armageddon is a completely different story. You go from having 120 minutes on the clock to seven. I mean, what are we doing? It's got to be 10-8. I think they got to change the format, but they change the format every year a little bit, um, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean, well, what happens is uh, exactly as I just said. I mean, Rajabov rides in. Beautiful initiative play here. And uh, nice little cold-blooded King G1 move to protect against Queen F2. Uh, it's move 40 now. Uh, both players have made it to the 40th move. And it's mate and six. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter that you get the bonus time if you defend this. Queen F8, and there's nothing you can do. And Queen F8 is the final move of the game. There is Queen D1, but then I would just play King G2, and that is it. That is it. You can stall, but uh, Rajabov wins a very complicated topsy-turvy Armageddon game to take the mini-match versus Ariantari. Now, the next match, I'm actually... It was also decided in Armageddon, but I will show you the classical game because it was the most exciting classical game, I think, of the round. Um, it was a... Uh, it was a Knight or of Sicilian, h3, e5, and, uh, I mean, very complicated. So h3 is called Adam's Attack, uh, named after, uh, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy. Um, also Michael Adams, I think. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe it's after another Adams. You know what? I'm gonna look this up. I actually don't know. Adam's Attack, Knight Orf. Uh, uh, uh... Uh, um, I don't know. Someone tell me in the YouTube comments. <laughs> Google couldn't solve my problems. It's kind of like when you Google, you have a stomachache. You find out you have 47 different types of illnesses. I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, anyway, E5, there's two approaches here by Black. You can play E6, but you can also play E5. Uh, and Knight back to B3. There is a line here by White as well to go Knight DE2 with the intention to play G4 and then Knight G3. And I think he theory here has shown that H5 is actually a good move. Uh, this is like very trendy. G3 is played, Black plays B5, very complicated position. Uh, but we have Knight B3 and everything that you're seeing here, uh, F4, all of this has been played many, 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 many times. Um, this position, for example, there are four main lines by Black. Castles, Rook C8, Queens, uh, uh, Castles, Rook C8, Queen C7, and B5. And I think they've all been played like over 50 times. Like all of them are very, very evenly matched in the database. Um, so Anish playing, you know, an approach of that style where at some point the queen will try to come out, the knight is gonna try to come this way, B5, A5, etc. Super complicated position. And you will be shocked to know that up until this moment in the game, they were following uh, Yu Yang Yi versus uh, Maxim Vachey Le Graf, 2021 November, Riga, Grand Swiss. Then they deviated for like two moves, and then they went back to that game. So I think for 20 moves, they were following the game between Yu Yang Yi and MVL. Did they know that? Oh, sorry, Yu Yang Yi, yes, and MVL. Did they know that? I have no idea. But look at this position. This is complete insanity. So Wang Hao is up a pawn. Anish sacrifices the rook to open up the king. Uh, Wang Hao doesn't take it because he's worried about rook e8, rook b8 stuff. So for example, take stakes, you know, you try to trade queens, the guy says no, rook b8 is a huge threat. Position is super complicated, right? So Wang Hao does not take the rook and instead takes the knight. He's got, he could also take this rook that would lose to queen a2, king c1, and the amazing move knight f3 and cutting the king's escape, and it's just forced mate in a couple moves, you might ask, isn't there mate? No. No. So that doesn't happen either. We have this. Uh, bishop a2, king c1, sacrificing the rook with check, making him take it, and now taking the bishop. So, dust settles. Material is an exchange up for white with a king who has been stripped of all his clothes. He's wearing one sock. All right, it's the pawn on b2. He's wearing one sock. He's stumbling around in the middle of the street. Some would call that, uh, you know, yeah, we need to invest better in our mental health programs. Uh, you know, the king's struggling a little bit. I would say the king had a little bit too much alcohol. Happens, all right? Um, and the craziest thing is that after bishop c4, white is not even worse. So if you take this bishop for free, I take the knight. And the only reason I couldn't take the knight immediately was because you would play queen c5 check, and I almost get mated, but luckily I can like somehow escape and it's perpetual check. Um, 
So bishop c4, Anish plays rook c5, and uh, the king is still being hunted, but luckily is just surviving. I mean, just surviving. h6, played by black, no back rank mate. And as always happens in insane Sicilian attacks, with best play, it's probably just a repetition of moves. And indeed, it proves to be a repetition of moves. Now, uh, Wang Hao could have ran uh, that way. It wouldn't have made a difference. He could have ran like all the way to g3. It wouldn't have made a difference. He would have still been hunted. And if he tried to get too far, he would have gotten mated. g5, bishop e6, and I, this is just not okay. That's just not cool. All right, at that point, someone's got to call the cops. All right, not American, but you know, like you know, a European. A little bit, they'd be a little bit nicer, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, the, the king on h5 is a little sus, a little suspicious king over here. Um, so king c2. Bishop, by the way, that was a joke. Just there might be like 25 viewers who are offended. It's a joke, a little YouTube joke. Relax. Some people watching might actually be police officers. I never know. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just current events, you know, trying to make some humor out of an otherwise very negative situation. It's not, not, you know. Come on. Relax. Relax. Let's go to the Armageddon before you get all, all mad. Write me, you don't know what you do. YouTube comments. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I just try to make some humor out of recent negative events. E4! Once again, in the Armageddon, c5, and we have the same thing, a lot of the same thing, but we don't have f4. So Wang Hao does not play f2, f4. He plays this approach, where you play g4, and uh, plays knight e5, and then Anish takes the bishop with the king. Sorry, he takes the knight with the king. All right. f3. Queen c7, castles, and then brings that rook over and does something we call castling by hand, all right? King f8, and then a couple moves later, king g8. This is actually a relatively normal approach in, uh, in Sicilians. The best move here, according to Stockfish, is king takes c7. Anish does know what he's doing. This king is actually completely safe. The only way the king would not be safe is if he could be attacked on the diagonals, or through knight moves. And neither of those things are possible. So black has enough time to completely consolidate and get his king to the g8 square. Now, this is a very different Sicilian than what we just saw. The Sicilian we just saw, Wang Hao went that way and a belligerent attack went that way. But his king's not there anymore. It's same side, right? So rook d1, bishop a6. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot here for Wang Hao to do, except stall. Which is like basically what you do in the Armageddon. Wang Hao is doing nothing, just absolutely nothing. It's really up to Anish to not get too low on time and to create a situation where he cannot lose. And there you go. It's the exact same thing that Rajabov did to Tari. He played g5 very early. Now we have h5, f4. So now he's now immediately in the span of like two moves. Anish just trying to stabilize. Knight, nope. Now Wang Hao is better. Takes, takes, knight f8, bishop back to g3. And I mean, white just has a more pleasant position. It's like plus 0.3, plus 0.4, five moves, six moves until we make it to the 40th move. Let's make it to the 40th move, guys. 36 moves. Black is slightly worse, but surviving. Here's the problem. All of a sudden, here comes 94, and we have a trade of queens. And at the very core of this issue, knight g4 is coming. All right, so Anish finds a way to trick Wang Hao and Wang Hao should have probably played queen f3 with the pin, right? Bishop d5 and then e6, double exclamation marks. And then uh, if f he, rook g6, if bishop takes, then this is hanging. Rook takes would have been the best move by black. But what happens in the game is uh, this. And now black is winning. I mean, Anish does not need a whole lot of time. He created a beautiful stable wall. And Wang Hao is trying his hardest, but one guy has two rooks. And what does Anish do? Trades off into an endgame where he absolutely cannot lose. And Wang Hao is not going to try to over the board flag Anish when he's getting one second bonus every single time. Anish Giri becomes the first person in Norway chess to win the Armageddon with black. It was like 6-1. All right? Almost like looking like Brazil, Germany. All right? I'm going to make a lot of people angry in this recap. Relax. All right? Don't hate me. It's your team that lost. Don't hate me. All right? Jeez.
Everybody take a deep breath. All right, I think if we can't learn to laugh at things, we're, we're doomed. Everybody's doomed. Coconut water is really tasty, by the way. Um, it's one of my favorite things to drink. Congrats to Anish. Now, the final game of this recap, if you had the patience to deal with my jokes, uh, this game is going to shock you. Uh, you are not going to uh, at all uh, understand what the heck happened in this game and why and how. Uh, you're ready? Because I'm not ready. Vishy Anand, all right? Versus Tapalov, two former world champions. Uh, Vishy goes for a Queen's Gambit accepted. Uh, Vishy won the first game with Classical. Keep that in mind. Uh, E4, the most aggressive approach by Topalov. B5, the most aggressive confrontational approach by Vichy. Very trendy nowadays to defend like this. A4, C6. And recently, the top guys have been playing this line with Queen B6 because they're absolute psychos. I mean, they're just lunatics. Uh, the main line here being Knight D5 attacking the Queen. Queen B7, Bishop F4, E5. Uh, Bishop E5, Knight D7. Bishop back to F4 or G3. I don't even remember. Knight f6, knight c7, king d8. I think uh, uh, a lot of games have gone like this. And uh, Levon has played like this himself. I mean, it's just an insane line. I think that's what Vichy came prepared to play. But Topalov plays knight c6. Sorry, knight c3. So you cannot play queen b6 now. Um, because white could take on b5, but doesn't have to. Like, white can play bishop e3. I mean, it's a, it's a move order thing. And white can play like this. White does not have to... Instead of that, what Vichy does is he immediately attacks the knight. That is why it's better to take like this, because this is a losing position for black. Knight b5, and you just cannot defend this pawn. So, uh, the move order matters, so we go to an entirely different game, where black gives uh, white, uh, uh, sorry, white gives black two pawns. This is a two-pawn gambit, but it's considered to be pretty good for, for, for white, because white gets a huge lead in development. Knight f3. And historically, the queen has gone here, here, or black will play b3. And black will get the queen back, uh, knight a3, and have really ugly pawns and try to defend the position. Vichy, for a second day in a row, just like he did against MVL, plays a move that I've never seen before. I've never seen anybody put the queen on d7. Because that's generally where the knight goes. So, Vichy takes a totally unique approach to this position, uh, gives back one of his pawns, and just... Moves his pawn, develops his knight, develops his bishop, and castles. All right, those four moves by Vichy teach you everything. Solidity, knight f6, bishop b7, castles. Just normal play. Let me just develop the rest of my pieces. I'm up a pawn. I'm doing very well. However, white is very pleasantly, uh, you know, vibing in this position because knight is going to go to b3, queen is going to be hit, like, black can get himself in trouble very quickly. You know, knight b3 attacks the queen. Queen has to move. Suddenly, the knight is coming to c5. The rook is coming to the c-file. I mean, this is just... It's a very pleasant position for white. It's just non-stop pressure, right? So, uh, Vichy just plays c5. He just gives him the pawn. Because when Tavalov takes this, here comes rook c8. And now Vichy actually has something to play for, right? He has good pressure here. He... Whoa. Vichy just goes from two pawns up for like a move or two to one pawn up to no pawns up to down a pawn what a swing however while topalov is is gorging himself with pawns vichy is catching up with development so that's it you can i'm feeding you these pawns but i'm winning back tempi right so take c7 take c7 and look at this position now it's white who can't move White cannot move. White is paralyzed. He gave him the two pawns to totally suffocate the white position. And black has no problems here at all. I mean, he trades the knight. The b2 pawn is just... I mean, it goes to b3, but now it's not moving. White can play... Uh, you know, white plays e5 a little bit later. I think Topalov plays e5, like on move 33. Um, but, I mean, black just... Uh, black just... Look, look at what black is doing. Black is standing outside like, come out! Do something! Do something! Come on! You know, you see like these viral fight videos. This she's outside of Topalov's house. Come on! Let's go! I saw I saw what you posted. Like, let's go, let's settle this. And Topalov's like, nah, bro, I'm I am i am good. It was a joke, bro. Uh now you're sounding like me. Oh man. We've come full circle. Nah, bro, it's just a joke. It's just a prank, bro. So white can't move. So if white can't move and black can't move, and white is up a pawn, it's kind of a mutual quagmire, if you will. Um Takes, takes. Now Vichy wins a pawn back. But now rook a1. Right? So, 
Queen takes b3 here, loses material, right? They're calling the police. Uh, on this game. Okay, guys. Okay. Come on. I'm trying to... Guys. I'm trying to record. Please. Oh, it's actually the fire department. It's the fire department. FDNY. Um, yeah, so something insane happens here. Something insane happens here. Uh, Black plays knight c3, queen d6. The game is over. Yeah. Topalov lost on time. It's move 37. If he had made three more moves, he would have gotten 10 seconds bonus for the rest of the game. In a completely equal position, queen takes b3, knight a5. It's just a draw. Completely symmetrical structure. We can trade, we could trade queens, we could just go home. Topalov loses on time after playing queen d6. Vishwanathan Anand is now back in the world top 10. He's also won two rounds of classical, which means he has six points out of six. All right. This recap has been goofy enough. I hope you enjoyed. Insane. Vichy winning Norway chess with six out of six. Uh, is Magnus at his peak? I don't know. Will Gotham make more terrible jokes in the next recap? Stay tuned to find out. Only on the Gotham Chess YouTube channel. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.